The rise of the internet in the 21st century has been accompanied by unprecedented levels of polarization, division, and coercion. At the same time, democracies are being hit by a huge range of different and rapidly evolving hostile state activities. Not all of them have their origins in Russia, though clearly some do, and these saw a significant scaling up after the 2014 invasion of Donbass. Today I'm discussing these issues with Carl Miller, an experienced digital researcher, author and international speaker. He is a partner and research director at Chasm Technology. We'll also be exploring the extraordinary technology and methodology behind BEAM, an initiative for defending information developed by Carl Miller and the team at Chasm Technology. Carl is also a visiting fellow at King's and an international speaker, as well as author of the fascinating book, The Death of the Gods, The New Global Power Grab. And I highly recommend to the audience that they get themselves a copy of that. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Carl is interested in how technology is changing society and politics. In 2012, he co-founded the first UK think tank institute dedicated to studying the digital world at Demos and has been its research director ever since. He writes widely on tech and society, including for The Economist, Wired, New Statesman, The Sunday Times, Telegraph, and The Guardian. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, then please do like and subscribe to help boost the popularity of our amazing speakers in YouTube. Carl, before we jump in, I have to say this is the second time I've had the privilege of speaking to you. Um, and that was right at the start of the, the war last year. Um, and since then, Beam has come out, uh, which, uh, you know, reading the white paper on that seems to be an extraordinary technology. Um, but let's jump in. And could you describe for the audience what it is uh, and something about the evolution of it? Well, Jonathan, uh, that's a kind introduction, firstly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me back on. Yes, my, my second time here. Um, and hi, hi to everyone listening to this. Um, so yes, Beam. Um, I'm, I've been relishing this interview, by the way, because it actually allows me to talk about the actual underlying method and tech for the work we do, which which is often actually stays in the background and is submerged, but it's vitally important in this kind of strange struggle we have over trying to protect our information spaces and therefore all the things that alarm them, including including our democracies. Um, so where to begin? Um, let me let me begin with um, let me go back kind of four or five years, Jonathan, because that's actually the 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 amount of time that we've been kind of developing and and trying to trying to breathe life into Beam, um, and and it began with us um, kind of be increasingly realizing that, and this is of course way before the the invasion of Ukraine and and and. Um, uh, and and all the changes that brought, but we were already realizing that information spaces were, um, for want of a better word, being seen as um, venues for conflict. Um, it was a flip that I think we, we'd increasingly seen happening in the militaries, actually, inclu including our own, inclu including liberal democratic militaries. But it was extremely important that that it wasn't that information was increasingly being conceived of by states, not as a tool of war but a theater of war and therefore joining air sea land and space as a kind of in a sense a, a metaphorical space that conflict actually happens within um back then um the reason i knew all this was because it was um happening within the tech giants so i'd go over to silicon valley and i'd spend time with twitter and i would spend time with facebook um and i, I began to realize and this is probably 2015 16 that um uh the they were spinning up all these teams dozens hundreds even kind of the world's best data scientists um who were kind of fighting this invisible battle between between themselves and states um now it wasn't uh they didn't really see it as democracy being under threat they kind of rather cheerfully described it to me as spam so they just thought it was a kind of user experience issue uh, which is a story entirely unto itself but that, that's where the kind of story, at least to me, begins. Um, and of course, Beam is not just me. It's a big team of people um, who've come at this from lots of different places and lots of different directions. But but to me, um, that's the starting point. Um, and the and I guess the underlying idea was that, that I and my colleagues didn't want 
civic society and academia and in general public life to simply be a spectator in that kind of conflict. It was always going to be far more consequential and important than something which was just going to be um, uh, happening between autocratic states on the one side and tech giants on the other. So the BEAM was our attempt, I guess, to try and put everyone else um, into the frame as well. So to give them the capability to begin to actually detect and understand and then respond to the kind of information threats which at that point um, were going largely unnoticed, I think. Mm. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because you 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 haven't specifically singled out Russia because these threats come from all sorts of different directions. I'm fascinated by the idea that liberal democracies would be engaging in a form of information manipulation as well. I'll have to maybe unpack that a bit further. But was there a real shift from seeing information as a space where you perhaps capture hearts and minds to space what? where you actively change and manipulate people's thinking? Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, let me let, let me um, be clear around uh, the, the kind of similarities and differences, I think, between liberal democratic states and autocratic states in this area that the, the, for sure, I mean, lib, 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 liberal democratic states also see, I think, information as venues of war. Um, but I, I do not think that they will engage in that war in, in anything like the same way as an autocratic state. And that, the reason for that, I think, is that the limiting factors here are not technical um they are legal and they're reputational um information warfare manipulating social media platforms is trivially easy for a military to do i mean if any military who can build a tank can manipulate facebook or twitter it's not expensive and it's not difficult but um very rightly of course here in the west and across liberal democ democracies around the world we have quite strong both legal injunctions but also actually um uh, conventions against militaries mucking around in information spaces and especially the press. Um, and for that reason, I think actually um, liberal demo le democratic militaries have actually not known what their license to operate in those spaces is. They, they don't really have rules of engagement. And for that reason, I think they probably limit themselves really in what they actually do in a way that autocratic states, of course, don't. Mm -hmm. So Everyone, you know, so largely then everyone has been, you know, I think realizing that these spaces are um, are, are are being contested information spaces, but but I think that largely liberal democracies have been on the defensive end of all of that, in my opinion. And there's another interesting strategic difference, isn't there? I mean, Russia has, I believe, for quite a long period of time now, considered itself at war with us. We have barely been aware of that um so again being in a state of war or not being in a state of war probably influences how active militaries are going to be in this if you don't think you're at war with a country you're not necessarily going to be messing around with this stuff um whereas whereas russia does seem to feel that it's in some kind of they call it civilizational struggle but they feel they've been in a in a sort of struggle around spheres of influence um at least since 2014, probably quite a bit earlier, as if many of my speakers, uh, you know, have, have suggested uh, that's the case. Um, one even suggested as early as 2003 um, for when things started to kick off. But I think it's very difficult to sort of identify. But certainly if you go back to that period, the techniques were less sophisticated. That's right. And, and you know, there's a series of, I, I think, like quite bulky and unsatisfying kind of concepts or phrases, which you'll hear if you go to any of the conferences, either either um, kind of attended by military or or state figures or, or, or researchers on this, you'll, you'll kind of hear um, concepts like the grey zone or kind of sub threshold conflict and um, uh, uh, hybrid warfare kind of floating around. Um, and I think they all I, I don't really like any of them per se. Um, but I think they all manage actually to touch on the kind of real kind of liminal nature of information warfare. It's this infuriatingly slippery thing that seems to sit right in the kind of interstitial gap between the different definitions, conventions, treaties, broad understandings that we have around what conflict is or isn't, when it happens, when it stops, who does it and who doesn't do it. Um, and you're right, I think because of all of those things, we haven't really realised um, quite what it meant to have states in like kind of really strategically contemplating information spaces as being something which they needed to fight within 
um, and to contest on, and that largely they were crucibles, I suppose, of geopolitical power now. And and another interesting aspect, isn't it, is is you know where does the um, purposeful manipulation, the strategic manipulation of information end, and where does the amplification uh, of those messages begin, which is more of a civilian problem, I guess. So one good example, of course, is around COVID, where there's a lot of conspiracy theory doing the rounds. Um, some of it is almost certainly organic. You know, it, it, it will pop up in different places. Different people will come up with those conspiracies and then amplify them. But there is also some evidence, isn't there, that some of the stories, some of the doubts, some of the conspiracies were potentially seeded uh, in a strategic fashion. And that must be very difficult from a technological point of view to try and build up a picture of what is an organic threat and what is a, a hybrid threat in that sense. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, Jonathan. And like, that is one of a, a thicket of um, empirical and methodological struggles that we have as researchers trying to shine any kind of light on these areas at all. Um, and that's really why kind of beam came into being so it, it it's it, firstly it, it it kind of tries to deal with information threats in the round um exactly because we saw that they were linked in ways which were sometimes obvious to us and sometimes less obvious but but equally important and so it's not just looking at disinformation per se it's also looking at kind of platform manipulation and other forms of kind of sub content um, ways in which um, people will um, try and um, massage and manipulate information environments, which I actually personally feel uh, tend to be actually much more important, really, actually, than the propagation of the, the content itself. Attention is a far more important resource online than than simply spamming some untruths around. Um, but then also extremism, um, uh, radicalization, conspir harmful conspiracy theories, um, harassment, hate, um, these are all now concepts which kind of jostle around with each other, you know, sometimes arising organically um, and sometimes not, uh, and often doing so um, side by side um, in ways which are really unclear. And um, trying to separate all of that and actually begin to attribute it and then begin to turn that into meaningful responses. That's really what, what Beam's trying to do. Where does this start? Because, you know, having... Um... Having worked on sort of tools that do sort of semantic analysis for marketing, one could say it's not so far away from propaganda. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's. I mean, one, it's very complicated uh, and it's very data intense. And of course, there's things like Google BigQuery and so on, which which help to sort of leverage uh, the processing power of of you know larger systems than we have, let's say, on site. But what I found when developing tools and is that you'll start off. And you'll imagine it, you know, it's going to be this and it's going to do that. But as you go through the development process, your understanding of what's possible and what isn't. And in fact, your conception of what that tool can do or should do changes. So I'd love to know those sort of generational changes um, mm. from when you started out to where you're at now. Mm. Well, it's extremely multi-led. And by the way, I should say at the outset that this has been a joint undertaking all the way through between basically a bunch of us at Chasm who tend to be um, kind of either data geeks or, or, or um, technology developers and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue who are subdometer experts around especially counter extremism and, and counter disinformation. And, and from 2050 Normans, really, we've been working kind of together project after project, um, bringing kind of beam quite iteratively into existence. Now, yeah, you're, it's it's really multi-layered though. Um, and in short, and I don't want to uh, belabor this point, but it goes all the way from fundamental technology development all the way through to big coalitions, relationships, and 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 um, and uh, and kind of working groups and and co coordinated um, responses. At the most fundamental layer. We actually began, uh, we, we founded Chasm because, um, and I'm, apologies to anyone from um, the kind of social listening world, but but I really um, couldn't use those platforms to answer the kinds of questions as a think tanker I was being asked by government. So this is around, this is early, this is 20, 2012. Um, we were being asked and wanted to know about things like radicalization and when that happened online and hate speech, how much of it happens. And, and, and basically social listening dashboards 
um, which were used in marketing advertising, just were were um, uh, incapable really of of answering those questions. So we began to build our own response, really, which is the opposite to all of that, called Method Fifty Two. Um, it, it basically allows um, subject matter experts to build pipelines to collect and, and manage um, social media data and analyze it in ways that they want. Um, and very, very important there is the use of natural language processing, a kind of the building of algorithms to make sense of very large data sets. So that allowed, that gave us a kind of capacity to be much more flexible in how we were doing the research and, and the data that we were collecting and then the kind of way that we would actually analyze it. And then from 2015 onwards, we we used Method 52 with with the ISD to to to, to really build out what Beam became, um, and um, it it basically took the form of a whole series of um, analytical pathways that that investigators and analysts would use to really pull apart um, what they thought might be um, disinformation campaigns um, or other kinds of information threats trying to understand what these narratives were, how they differ from each other, the accounts underlying them, how accounts across different platforms might be linked, whether there were signs of inauthentic behavior, who the audiences were that might be being targeted, what effects all of this might be having on the audiences, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, to begin to push all of that into the kinds of organizations that actually can respond. Um, it's fine having data geeks and researchers um, pulling apart these kinds of things, but but we we kind of quickly realised that this wasn't going to be something which is which is purely obviously a kind of research driven endeavour. This has to be something which we're responding to, and that means and really this is the power of civic society. We can respond to it in ways which are far more powerful actually than the tech giants, um, and 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 connecting the outputs of being to increasingly larger coalitions of organizations. That's been something us and ISD have been trying to do over the last couple of years to, to really try and scale up the kind of responses which we can have. Because ultimately you're not just providing reports for a single government department or whatever. You know, you have multiple clients, I would assume, and you have different projects, different objectives. And of course, some of your visualizations of that data uh, work incredibly well in the media as well. So you can't just sort of crunch some numbers and pass them to some sort of you know bean counters in a in an office in Whitehall you have to be far more um touchy-feely dare I say with the the sort of product that you create well there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with sometimes passing research uh into government of course uh and we're um or, or, or to regulators you know we're, we're proud of that bit of our work because government and regulators are, are a part of the response as well um but but of course, and I think actually a really good example of this is is the brilliant work that ISD is has, has done um, uh, to uh, kind of uh, coordinate the coalition against climate disinformation. So um, that's bringing together dozens and dozens of climate action charities and um, corporate responsibility and transparency activists and so on all around basically the disinformation and manipulation that 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 uh, might be happening around um cl uh, climate action discussions around the world and especially centering on the on the cop summits each year so it started in cop 26 went on to cop 27 and over that time basically the organizations that are involved that are um not only actually um receiving out outputs from us but are actually being onboarded onto the technology uh, and beginning to create whatever outputs they themselves that they want um, has grown um, enormously in a way which is really pleasing to see. And I think actually that kind of coalitional response, that is the future of, of this kind of work for civic society, you know, where you have organisations that each have a different reason perhaps for being worried about disinformation in a, in a, in a broad area, um, have different levers at their disposal and will pull them in different ways. Everything from long-term strategic advocacy, policy change, legal change, all the way through to much more tactical, responsive media work, um, disclosure to the platforms, liaison with with with, with government uh, and other public sector bodies and so on. And if we come back to um, Method 52, which, I mean, that, that could be an extraordinary science fiction novel or something. That's a, that's a great name there for the X-Files. But... If you're trying to look at a, at a particular narrative and you, su you suspect a narrative that's originated in a certain account or set of accounts um, is uh, a weaponization of information, 
how does the system actually do that? Do you have to look far more holistically at the history of behavior of that account and associated accounts? How far back in time do you have to go? And I'm fascinated in really how much data uh, and how much you have to project back in time into that ecosystem where that data came from um, in order to understand whether it's weaponized uh, narrative or not. Mm. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Great question. And yeah, no, a wonderful. Uh, th thanks for prodding me to go deeper into the actual methodology here. Um, so uh, Beam and method and, and therefore Method 52 basically have um, two different modes, um, which we typically um, will will jump between. Um, firstly, we'll use it in a, a kind of much more general kind of monitoring way. Um, and that's where we're either monitoring a space, forms of language. Typically, we'll deploy Beam around a specific event or a specific worry. So either an election or something like a COP summit or, or sometimes a kind of longer standing theme that we think might be being attacked. Or say activists um, uh, uh, or journalists that we think are being targeted. And there we'll typically establish a kind of constantly running kind of collection and analysis loop. Um, the... Key machinery there is, and I've, I've mentioned this already, and I kind of shied away from one, wanting to go deeper because I'm afraid it sounds too technical, but it's called bespoke natural language processing. And the, the point is basically to train um, machines to make the kinds of decisions which humans do around the way we use language. So that might be training algorithms to detect certain kinds of narratives that we think are um, worrying. It might be that we are... Um, simply trying to split a discussion into lots of different topics or themes, latent uses of language, calls to action, um, uh, violence, harassment, threats, hate speech, whatever it is, um, and then um, and then basically watch how that changes over time. Now, when big changes happen there in ways that we're worried about or think are important, that kind of triggers this second mode of being. And that's when we actually much more iteratively begin to pull these things apart. So say there's been lots of harassment flooding towards journalists that are, say, writing about greenwashing. Well, I, I, there, it's much more case-specific, um, but typically we'll be looking at that activity, and then there is normally a kind of workflow that goes from very large amounts of data into increasingly smaller amounts of data as it becomes increasingly more investigatory. So we might realize there's certain kinds of harassment and we'll be using algorithms to analyze hundreds of thousands of messages and really isolate some of the harassment, um, feel that might be a trend. And at that point, you're big, that, that kind of workflow is beginning to morph into much more open source intelligence work. So you're, as you winnow it down, you begin to become less a algorithm crafter uh, and more a kind of data journalist where you might see a particular lead. Oh, isn't it interesting these accounts will create it at the same time or that they are, seem to coordinate in the people they attack um, or they seem to be sharing links from a particular Telegram group. It really can be a whole host of different signals, you know, that, that anyone that works in this area kind of gets a, gets a sense of as a lead um, and then will increasingly become kind of narrow and narrow, more and more focused as, as open source intelligence um, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of online investigators um, uh, and ethnographers, of course, so people that really understand the particular online sub communities that tend to do these kinds of activities, they become involved. And that's actually where us and ISD collaborate and where I find that collaboration to be, well, there's, I mean, it's it's fruitful in so many ways, but that's one of the brilliant interactions that we have where, you know, uh, on the one hand, you need people that are interested in algorithms and 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 uh, emerging and powerful data scientific um capability on the other you need people that know about um how to dig into certain kinds of online phenomena and and one of the really difficult things about this whole work is how you join all those things up together because they really don't sit in the same heads and the same people and i guess what you do with that information is the other one i mean you can you can try and make people aware of it but i guess that's very expensive and difficult to 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 publicize the findings in that way, or you can share them with experts at the conference, to, I guess, to try and make people aware that there's this targeting going on, that there's a concerted effort to undermine uh, messaging there. Maybe if journalists are aware of that campaign, they might mis not misreport um, some of those public concerns. As we know, the reporting methodology with the, the two sides methodology um, can very easily be weaponized um, where you have, you know, 
95% of scientists saying something, and you've got some rather exciting voices over here, you know, 1% or whatever, 5% saying something radically different. Mm. Um, it, it, it's easy to weaponize that, uh, that process. Um, but uh, how, how do you then sort of um, activate the information and, and, and make it impactful when, you know, you're sure your findings are, are robust? Well, actually, so uh, another great question, Jonathan, and, and actually responding to all of this is is an important part of Beam as, as anything to do with the technology or algorithms or or data science or method 52. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's an area where um, we're having to basically work out, build and evaluate responses which go beyond um, simply knowing that it is there and making that public. Um, and that might be everything from, um, you know, um, divining and 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 consolidating big strategic trends that we want to feed into policy making you know processes and and whitehall machinery um it might be um uh, disclosing the information and working with communities that are closest to the communities that are being targeted as possible um to kind of um uh, build resilience it might be that we um work with strategic communication um organizations and actually kind of either counter message um uh the uh, the information uh all the narratives involved sometimes of course we we will also um try and talk to the platforms um about the trends that we're seeing um and if they're um especially harmful uh, and the accounts are propagating messages in ways which are in contravention of um platform policies uh we want those platforms uh, we want those accounts taken down um that is an area though where um probably more creativity is needed across the board than anywhere else here um, you know, we, we, we're kind of in this moment now where disinformation especially has has turned from a reasonably narrow specialist topic that think tankers were worried about, as it was two or three years ago, into something which seems to be happening everywhere to everyone and where everyone's becoming involved. And one of the things that that one of the good things that that brings us is that we now have more organizations trying to respond to disinformation than we've ever had before. And what we really need to do is work out the whole kind of spectrum of different responses, which might actually be powerful um, and to um, be, of course, ruthlessly empirical uh, in which of those work, and which of those don't. But basically to try many more things than I think we're currently trying that might actually make a difference. And that, of course, is only going to get worse. I mean, this is something we we touched on in the first interview and it's, um, uh, you know, it, it reveals a sort of... Um, let's say a penchant for sci-fi uh, that I've got, but, um, you know, we're, we're not far away from the possibility of uh, machine learning algorithms being told, this is the narrative we want to propagate. Here are 500 personas. Now go off and, and rewrite this narrative, um, you know, in the voice of all these personas. So the automation of this process uh, in incoming I could say years, possibly even months, um, means that the scale of disinformation could well grow to extraordinary proportions. And then you combine that with deep fake imagery, deep fake video, it uh, becomes uh, quite worrying. Right. And and uh, we'll, we'll kind of, in, in a way, grow closer to us, I think. And and actually, the, the, the trend that I am personally most worried about is, is, is the way in which... Um, um, NLP and virtual agents um, can be used to create quite long-standing persona that, that might actually develop friendships and longer-lasting relationships with us. Um, you know, influence happens through people that we know uh, and that we respect and trust. Um, that's why the kind of spamming of kind of kind of disinformation narratives into the ether, in and of themselves, is not likely to have a huge impact and is actually not particularly worrying. But Imagine that there are all these presences online which will talk to you, will, will listen to you about what day you've had, will allow you to vent or to gripe, um, and will talk to and will will tell you about their day. Imagine growing those kinds of relationships over time, tens of thousands of them, with with all these different people in say targeted in a, in a targeted community. That would create the kind of social links, the trust, and the long standing kind of kinship. The influence will flow through, um, 
And, uh, all, you know, there are many technology trends which are happening around us, around our ears at the moment. But that, the the ability for, to, for machines to sound more and more convincingly like human beings is definitely one of the most powerful, important, and I would say dangerous. Um, so, I, yeah, the, I mean, I, I suppose the, under, the underlying kind of other reason for us trying to work as kind of frenetically as we can here is is this suspicion that, that the actual trade craft for influence operations is likely to become more powerful like the the trends that we see in technology are likely to um uh kind of allow these kind of um the manipulation of information to um ever more successfully sink hooks into our psychologies and to who we think we are and how we think so um we we really do need to defend these information spaces in 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 ways which are robust because um even if they're not affecting you now um, in the future, I think they will. Hmm. Oh, one of the things that that um, you know people get, a, especially uh, well, uh, the topic of Ukraine has united a lot of people on different sides of the political spectrum. So actually, people listening to this podcast will be from the the complete spectrum. Uh, I mean, quite literally, from Brexity MAGA all the way to uh, what would be termed, you know. Um, uh, quite left wing, so we have lots and lots of people united in in a common concern and and united in the understanding that that Russia's an aggressor. So it's quite a delicate topic, though. And sometimes, if I stray into uh, what has been called uh, Trump derangement syndrome, one of my uh, kind listeners has accused me of that. Um, I try to measure what I say and and be much more empirical. But it's a difficult question, isn't it? Because you know one of the arguments here is going to be well. You know, um, you call it weaponized information. I call it bias. You revile Fox News. Well, I despise CNN because quite clearly you have editorial bias in every form of media. How do you tell that difference between what is, you know, bias or a slant on the news or a an editorial choice to go with one kind of angle and actual intentional disinformation on the other well and the, the first step i think is actually to get rid of the term disinformation um the the the, the, the kind of the lies that are being told aren't useful usefully identifiable the kind of content level they're about search engine manipulation um they're about the creation of false identities and false persona they're about the use of malicious scripting and automation. You know, there is a trade craft here um, and um, the propagation of disinformation is, is only one part of that. And I would don't think really an important part. When you actually pull these campaigns apart, you know, very often they're really not much to do with truth claims at all. They're to do with making you um, angry about feeling that your identity is under threat. Um, they're to do with activating a sense of injustice and outrage in you. They're to do with emotionality much more than they are to do with um, uh, uh, truth and falsehood. Disinformation, I really think, is an extremely poor frame um, to understand all of this through. And I, I it, on the one hand, I try not to do it, but use use it. But on the other, it's almost impossible not to, because it's it's simply, it's kind of descended from fake news, I think, actually, is that's the reason why um, it's, it's become such a widespread kind of label to understand all these various things. But no, the problem, in, at least in my view, is that there is a trade craft being both developed and deployed by sophisticated actors, kind of information warfare professionals, on behalf of political campaigns, on behalf of autocratic states, sometimes disaffected individuals, to very kind of systematically change how you think in ways which are covert and undeclared. Now, whether you are supportive of Trump or or hate Trump, whether you watch Fox or CNN, I think all of us can probably agree that we don't want kind of hidden campaigns um, secretly hacking our political opinions. I, I like to think that there is still enough, just enough commonality um, amongst different political tribes to want there to be um, some basic ground rules around how information swells around us um, and how arguments are made and, and which arguments are seen. Um, and actually, uh, information warfare operators from 
Russia or China or Latin American countries or the Philippines or so many other parts of the world now, you know, they don't want that to be fair. In fact, they want all of that to be um, massaged and manipulated in their interests. So um, I, I've never seen what we do as being a partisan intervention of any kind. Um, I really don't think it is. And that's I think that's what makes it especially interesting. And, and for me as well, it's analysing the methodology rather than the individual narrative that could be labelled leftist or rightist. It's looking at the actual system or technology, as the, the, the Russian propagandists would call it. It's the political technology of how you actually hack people's brains. Um, what you then do with it, I guess, is the question where we're going to come on to. But first of all, I think you said something absolutely fascinating there, which is that everybody gets hooked on the narrative, on the message, and they miss the point, I think, as you say, of what is trying to be achieved here, which is to hack your emotions first of all. Then whatever message they want or whatever action they want can be imprinted upon you, but they have to hack you emotionally at a deeper level. And I think um, if you go back to the research Pavlov did with the dogs, again, we're back to Russia. <laughs> I think all this psychological manipulation did originate there. And it's no wonder the Bolsheviks actually funded an institute for Pavlov to continue his experimentation. But I think one of the key things he found, which was then leveraged by uh, you know the KGB, was that if you can get people into a state of terror, if you can get them into a state whereby, as you say, their identity is undermined, but beyond that, you know, um, their whole idea of the world uh, get them into an emotional state um, where they feel utterly threatened, you can then imprint all sorts of ideas and the human brain will take ideas and it'll soak them up like a sponge when it's in that kind of manipulated state. And that seems to me what you're talking about here. Um, th this methodology is far more about uh, hacking emotions before you imprint uh, messages. Right. And actually, um, one, even more profoundly, not just emotions, but I think belonging uh, and identity too. Um, you know, really the kind of what is happening is that um, kind of these trade crafts are being used to help propel forwards entire movements and, 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 uh, and communities um, that are uh, kind of utterly militated against kind of mainstream ways that kind of claims are being validated in the first place and, and either and, and evidence and either proved to be right or wrong. I mean, this disinformation or, or, or information warfare is far more to do with the creation of cults than it is to do with the propagation of lies. Um, you know, and uh, kind of, you know, it, 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 one thing you really do realise is that um, is that these kind of alternative worlds that have been built have entirely parallel structures of kind of epistemology, as in the creation and 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 validation of truth claims. They have their own investigators, they have their own researchers, they have their own journals, they have their own outlets. Um, you know, we and and really think that um, the whole kind of machinery of mainstream news, journalism, academia, and politics is hopelessly compromised. You know, riven through. With whatever you know, in in insert you know, in, insert gripe, corporate interests or wokeness or whatever it is, um, that's the big tectonic shift is the creation of those movements, um, and that they're being created not by often lying to people and getting them to change their minds, but by activating people's sense of identity threat, people's sense of enemy or or listlessness or or, or, or feeling like they have no meaning in, in you know, in the world. Um, and then, and then um, stepping into that um, void with a real sense of community identity and meaning. Um, very similar to radicalization processes, actually. I mean, very, very similar in, in, in who is um, often lured in and targeted uh, and, and really what that, uh, the kind of meaning that that can bring to the people that are then indoctrinated. Um, but no, I, I, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think this is a, a social and cultural phenomenon first and a kind of rational and intellectual phenomenon uh, second. And that brings the question that, uh, I mean, you said that it's a relatively cheap 
uh, methodology to manipulate information. Nonetheless, it's not cost free. And to do it at the kind of scale that Russia certainly engages in and potentially China, too. I mean, we're talking tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds a year, billions over, if not billions, um, you know, no one's exactly sure. Um, to invest that kind of money, you must want some kind of dividend. So people who engage in this manipulation, do you get a sense of what the what the win is for them? Well, I mean, let's remind ourselves first that, that uh, you know, a couple of hundred million uh, kind of dollars a year for a military is a couple of fighter planes. Like these, those aren't particularly large budgets. So, and and to be honest, I I, I honestly think that kind of information manoeuvre by autocratic states is has always been somewhat of a rounding error in terms of their military budgets. I I, I don't think it's a hugely resource intensive thing for them to do. Um, uh, but I mean, and also just just as another sidebar, um, it's uh, one of the other interesting trends we've seen over, say, the last year and a half or so is is really the profusion of um, kind of private sector uh, kind of versions of this trade craft. Um, I mean, they've always been there, but but it's become much, much more copious uh, and and available over over um, the last. Um, uh, yeah, kind of year and a half or so. Um, can they measure whether this really works? Um, probably not. I mean, we can't. Um, a question I, I'm asked very, very often is, you know, how do we, how can we really tell whether any of this is um, really making an impact? And I, you know, I, at least as far as I, I know, um, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. If you go into a digital marketing kind of uh, a kind of campaign in the middle of a general election and ask um, the campaigners there whether they can really know whether any particular um, part of the campaign is really effective. I mean, I don't think they can. I mean, they try their best retrospective at the end, but during, you know, in the, in the midst of the melee, they're just firing out really whatever they can. And they they know that the, the voters on the other side are being bombarded by stuff from all over the place. You know, we live in an extremely noisy world and which of those particular bits of information maybe got them to change their main mind, maybe got them to 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 donate or or to or to uh, volunteer their time. I often think we don't know which bit of information really got us to change our mind in that particular way. And and certainly again when we're dealing with um how we feel really rather than what we think, I think that process becomes even murkier to us all. And certainly so, not in real time. I mean, in the kind of time span you're looking at in an election, you're looking at something on the scale of weeks. Whereas, you know, if I'm running a digital marketing campaign, I'll often tell clients, well, we're going to need a couple of months worth of data to actually understand even partially what's going on here. And it's the same with the learning algorithms that, say, Google deploys to mm. fine tune your campaigns. They require weeks upon weeks worth of data before you can see any kind of uptick in in or improvement. So I guess you're faced with that challenge or the, the disinformation um, machine has that challenge that you, you can't really analyze impact in real time. You just have to throw it out there and uh, try and understand what's worked in the past and repeat the same. Yeah, and it's also the way that the you know this trade craft kind of really emphasizes being like spliced into existing um uh social trends and and cleavages you know it, it doesn't create conspiracy theorists it amplifies them you know it doesn't create political extremism it uses it you know it it, it, it in you know political polarization is a long-term trend you know stemming all the way back to the 90s that is just a very useful thing for information warfare to to exploit all of these things would exist anyway you know and so the kind of and this is of course like one of both the fantastically interesting but also very worrying and infuriating aspects of research in this area the interaction between organic inorganic between um uh between um societal trends which are which are which are true and those which have been interacted with in some way is extremely murky and difficult and often you know genuinely probably uh, impossible for us to completely tease apart mm -hmm. and, and of course the the other challenge with um if we look at uh you know the audience and what the disinformer is trying to achieve um it might not be a concrete action you know they might not want actual action on behalf of their audience they might actually want the opposite. They might want indifference and apathy. They might want to sow doubt and despair. 
Um, so you, you probably, you know, you probably can't measure any of those qualities. Um, as in the case of Belarus, all you can say is, did they have a Maidan and a revolution? Was it successful? No, it wasn't. Well, probably these actions in aggregate were successful overall, but but not just difficult, but impossible to measure, I would guess. Yeah, or sometimes it might not even be a broad populational outcome that's intended at all. It might be just that the political decision makers feel under slightly greater pressure or um, the, um, they 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 think that um, the kind of prospects of the next mayoral election might be a little dimmer if they, you know, if they condemn Russia too much. I think that there's all kinds of um, ways in which information environments can, can cause outcomes, I think. Um, and we probably kind of, we probably kind of assumed perhaps too much that that broad populational shifts is what's is what's intended here. But no, I mean, it might well be that a very narrow group of very extreme, entirely unrepresentative, but extremely noisy and galvanized individuals become a little more emboldened, you know, and that that might be the real effect. And in that respect, I mean, can this technology, and I think you've you sort of answered that earlier, but can this technology explicitly not just help with better governance and intelligence and military decisions, but actually can it help in um, you know reinforce uh, civic society? Can it help improve the quality of journalism, which in itself um, is is a positive? Well, yeah, I mean, it really is to civic society that Beam Beam was created. So the the whole the whole um, vision really was to put. Um, uh, civic societal actors, journalists, um, a- academics, uh, and of course, kind of NGOs and charities, kind of as much as possible into the driving seat. Um, and I, I should say, by the way, and I, I've neglected to say this up to now, the other thing that j- just we, we were very convinced of, I think, when when Beam was created, was that there was a kind of enormous overfocus of research and work really happening around information threats to Western Europe and America. Uh, and we really wanted um, to be able to create something which could um, kind of engage with and and speak to the the most underserved parts of the world, languages and communities. Um, which again, like everything to do in this uh, area, is multi layered. So it has everything to do. You know, it begins with the technology. You know, um, being able to. You know, we we always lean towards technology which we could use in any language that we wanted to um, we've kind of deployed beam I, I i think in around 12 languages you know devahi and arabic and mandarin and vietnamese and russian you know as well as uh, as well as english and, and and european languages um but it goes all the way up to the coalitions and the partners that we use beam for and the and the deployments that we make beam to do you know from kind of sexual reproductive rights activists in kenya you know through to um uh through to um kind of information warfare hitting singapore and malaysia so, you know, and I think that that's probably also, I would say, along with the kind of growth of coalitions in this area is the, is the other great big kind of shift or trend that I think we really need to propel forwards now. Um, actually, the the bits of the world that are um, not being served at the moment enough by this work are actually the bits of the world that probably are being hit more uh, and might be more vulnerable. Um, and of course, information spaces as well that, that are being overlooked. You know, we've over, we've over focused a lot on Twitter and Facebook. We need to do a lot more research on Wikipedia. And Telegram is a whole other can of worms, isn't it? And Telegram's unbelievably important now, yes. Uh, and, and in many ways, is a kind of connective tissue um, between uh, lots of other platforms and the manoeuvre that happens on them. Well, you've, you've, you've answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which was, you know, one of the challenging things of any technology is making it multilingual and making the algorithms effective in multiple languages. So you've got you've got that one nailed. And also this idea that actually, you know, a lot of Russian, uh, again, I'll use the term disinformation, but a lot of Russian narratives, weaponized narratives um, are not so effective, certainly in alliance countries. Uh, and, and you know, to a greater or lesser extent within Europe. So, of course, a lot of those have been focusing on, say, the global south, India and so on. So, as you say, especially important because those other areas are both the target for, you know, economic objectives of uh, China and Russia to an extent, but also, you know, their markets for military hardware and their markets uh, or their countries that that fit potentially within a sphere of influence that, you know, say Russia is trying to increase its influence in in, in Africa. 
uh, and 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 some other places to try and counterbalance the influence of the US. So there's all this sort of stuff going on. Vital that your technology um, works not just for the Western alliance. Yeah, I mean, exactly right. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, both influence campaigns and geopolitical geopolit fissures are happening outside of the English language. <laughs> uh, and we need, uh, we really need to, uh, uh, of, of course, build capability and the relationships and the deployments that simply recognises that. And uh, my last question really is where next with it? Obviously, it's been a long time in development. Um, there's lots of sort of very tangible uh, sort of data sets and insights you've created now uh, going into these conferences and in the media. Um, what's, what is the next era of development and what, what's the next couple of years look like for, for Beam? Well, personally, I want to scale it really and and find ways of um, deploying it to not dozens, but 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 probably hundreds of different information contexts around the world. Um, one of the things that I think makes me more worried about information warfare than anything else is just how malleable and versatile an idea it is. I mean, the same basic idea that information is is a theater of war, of course can change the way that a presidential election looks and how it must be secured, but also local elections, you know, also pressure on judges, you know, pressure on local officials, officials, harassment of um, local investigative journalists or crime reporters, um, uh, the, the way in which um, kind of activists can be pursued from one country to the next, um, you know, and, and of course the themes that are being targeted too so from big elections and political conversations into stuff like climate change and 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 uh and uh, sexual rights you know and it will ever it will just continue to spread i think and continue to become kind of more ubiquitous so one of the things i would really like to do and this is not by the way a a a, a, a solved problem at all but is work out how we can connect more and more people up um uh and work with them and um, both in receiving and helping us make the detections that we do make. But then, of course, you know, in, in these large coalitions, which um, I think lots of people can be feeding into and lots of people can be um, acting from um, in, in kind of acting in much more concerted, strategic ways to solve this problem. Um, the problem is strategic. Like our response also has to be strategic. It has to be very long term. It has to be um, uh, it has to be cross sectoral uh, and has to involve just a, a, an almost dizzying number of different kinds of organization. Um, so in many ways, really, that's not a technological, technical or empirical challenge. That's really an organizational one. Uh, and I, I would say that that's probably where what I think the great, where the greatest pressure, but also the greatest kind of potential for um, for growth uh, and and development really is at the moment. Because you have to get social media platforms, you have to get media owners, publications, journalists, governments, there's a lot of people to kind of guess get on side to actually leverage, uh, you know, the benefits of your findings and insights. Yes, and you you know you you need think tanks and researchers and NGOs. You know, and th 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 these are organisations that typically are much smaller, of course, than like very large tech companies or obviously governments um, or militaries. Um, you know, they tend to have kind of um, specialist uh, uh, kind of um, concentrations of knowledge. Some are really good at speaking to the organizations that are being or the people that are being targeted. Others know more about the people doing the targeting. All of that is a is 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 something that has to be knitted together into a um uh into a kind of responsive um apparatus in a way for um for for responding to information threats. Um very difficult, but um, but I think at least over the last couple of years. And um, what has been gratifying is is the kind of I guess the range of recognition now that that this is a r really kind of um, existential cross societal kind of problem, and in many ways it just interacts with all the other problems that we have. You know, we climate action becomes much more difficult when you when you pursue climate activists and you um you know uh, propagate greenwashing narratives and you um uh, and you deny uh, online spaces um for a respectful democratic discussion around uh, what climate action should look like. You know, I just copy and paste that same idea across all the other you know immensely important decisions that we need to make as a as a species, and and that's the problem. 
It's very, very confusing and very messy. Well, I have to say, Carl, it's been absolutely fascinating taking this sort of second dive in and reading about Beam. Uh, I'll put a link in, in there to the site so people can sort of check that out. Uh, and if there are any sort of key publications uh, that you think would be useful to share, we can put those into the video description as well. But I want to say a huge thank you for your time again and for the incredible work you and your team are doing. Thanks, Jonathan. Really nice to speak to you again. And, and thanks for listening for everyone.